Well, hello there and a lovely big warm welcome to today's webinar. My name is Sharon Mark Taggart and I am the one of the co-founders and directors of the Curious Piano Teachers. And Sally is just on the other line, so if you bear with me for just a moment, I am going to get her onto the call. And um, in the meantime, if you can find the, the chat, I'd love you to type in and let us know exactly whereabouts it is you are, are listening from today. So, um, okay, Sally, I think that's going to be you joining the call right now. It is indeed. Um, hello, everybody. Hey, hello, hello. Here. Hello. So Sally is the other uh, director and co-founder of the Curious Piano Teachers. And uh, it may be, I know we have, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of you registered for this um, call today. So um, we probably won't be able to keep up with, uh, with all the comments and all the chat, but we will do our best to keep up with as much of it as possible. So I'm just going to, um, to give a, a call out to some of you here. Um, we have, Louise, who is listening in from Stratford upon Avon, upon Avon. Uh, we have uh, Liz, we have Richard, who is in Cambridge, we have Jonathan uh, from North Wales, we have uh, Sharon from Hertfordshire, we have Melanie, we have Isabel um, listening in from Northumberland. So we have Rachel uh, in Scotland. So yes, pretty much, and Christine has just hopped in to say hello from Dublin. So quite literally all over um, the, the UK and Ireland. And we also have Helen. Hello, Helen, who's listening in um, today as well. Okay. I'm not going to... Uh, I'm going to move on quite swiftly because I know that Sally has lots of exciting content to get through today. Uh, and I want to ask you guys another question. Today, uh, and I'm sure you will be familiar with this little character here who has been uh, featured on the, uh, the promotional material regarding this particular call. And uh, the question has been, is there anything wrong with all cows eating grass because I know this was the way I was taught um, and of course that is the the base clef spaces where um, you're reading up the A, the C and the E and the G. So I'm first of all quite curious to know um, is that a mnemonic approach the approach that has been that you have learned Maya? Um, if you used another, if you were taught by another approach, then please let us know what that was. And we also want to know what kind of problems you are experiencing at the moment in your piano teaching um, with, regards to, uh, with regards to teaching notation. Um, oh, lovely. We have Gary listening in from Reading. <laughs> It's always good to meet our curious guitarist, isn't it? Hello, Gary. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> we also have Irina. So yes, guys, it's lovely. I know there is lots of you already on the call and I'm sure there are going to be lots more of you popping in. Um, and I'm, I'm noticing names that I, I haven't noticed or recognized from before. So um, I'm guessing we have quite a few first timers on here. So an especially very warm welcome to you. Sally. Yeah, I'm just, um, I'm seeing uh, what Gary has put. Can I just say to everybody, first of all, that when you want to write to everybody, you need to make sure that you click panelists and attendees. So if you have a little look in your chat box, you'll see that it, you, you can have the option to do to panelists or panelists and attendees. And if you do it to panelists and attendees, then any questions that you have, everybody will be able to see. Otherwise, it's only just Sharon and I and, and, uh, which is lovely, but we'd like to share them with everybody else because Gary has said that he only has one stave, of course, as a guitarist, but still have problems. And that just made me think, of course, you know, with the piano, we have two staves. So could you say we have twice as many problems um, as other instruments? And I think probably the answer to 
to that is definitely yes. So we'd love to hear, as Sharon said, um, about the problems that you're currently having or have had in the past with, with teaching notation, pupils learning notation, um, and also whether you've got any memories at all of how you were taught. I mean, I can certainly remember, um, I think I was taught with mnemonics, pretty certain I was, but I certainly know when I started to teach many moons ago now, um, I use that lovely book, and it is a lovely book by Fanny Waterman, um, and uh, it's the Piano Lessons Book One, which is still quite popular in, in the UK. And it has, it's a very musical book, and it has lots of lovely teaching ideas, but it does use mnemonics. And it, it really foxed me for a long, long time why there were so many problems with pupils learning um, notation and how to read notation. Um, so Liz is saying she was taught with FACE, cows and good boys, etc. Yes, absolutely. Um, and Helen is saying she was taught a mixture. First note you were learnt was B on the recorder. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, we, again, we have all these problems, don't we? So if you start with a, with a one line instrument, whether it's treble clef or bass clef, when you go onto the piano, you then have to learn the other one. And um, I know children... the problem of, of them getting them mixed yeah, up. And, and understanding that a note on the third line can have more than one name. And I, I know in my realm, you know, because I do a lot of Kodai work and we use what's called the relative stave. So, um, or relative pitch, where actually I can move it anywhere up and down, you know. And it's the children who learn the instrument who you show the middle line and, you know, you say, well, that's, that's, that's so. No, that's B. <laughs> the fact that it's got no clef there is irrelevant. They know, their teacher has told them, that's a B. And um, it, it's quite hard to break through all those perceptions. And it's certainly not a straightforward or easy job. And nor do I pretend that we have all the answers because uh, there's no such thing. Absolutely. But... Hopefully what you will be getting today is um, a very clear insight into, um, into what you can do if you're finding that you are getting, um, that you're getting frustrated. Um, it's about having strategies. It yeah. is. About knowing strategies. knowing what, how to set up the right background and then having the strategies to deal with it. And I'm being very pleased with myself because I have problems saying the word strategies. <laughs> <laughs> one of those words I can't say. Strategy. All right. Strategy, yes. Um, so let's get back to the serious subject in hand. So we've got uh, Ray, Marie, Ray Marie from Michigan. Teaches mnemonics too, but she kept people in the treble clef and animals in the bass clef. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. interesting, isn't it, how we, we do this and populate them. Yeah, and there is some quite interesting research about this, really. Um, starting teaching students to recognize steps. Oh, it's gone. It's just, it's just skipped. Steps and skips, I think. Um, Jonathan, that was. And also trying to see patterns. Okay. Yeah, more on that later. Jonathan. Okay. So as those come in, Sharon, do you want to um, do what you're going to do for a couple of minutes? Yes. Yeah. So keep any will. thoughts coming in, folks, about this idea of. Um, how you were taught and actually what you currently do and what would be great to know is what problems you're currently having in your teaching because then we can come back to those at the end of the session and see, see if we can deal with them so i'm now going to hand over to sharon for a few minutes and then i'll be back to tell you more about the uh how to set up the right conditions and the strategies this strategy is lovely. Thank you, Sally. Um, now, what I'm going to do, and I'm going to be really, really brief about this, um, but we know that there are quite a few of you on the call today who um, have probably not been on a, a webinar that we've hosted before, and there's a good chance you, you don't know a lot about what we do. Um, so, essentially, Sally and I, I set up the Curious Piano Teachers uh, in 2015. And uh, we have a wonderful, a wonderful, and I'm sure that if we have any members, I'm pretty sure we have members on here today. Yes, we have. Um, 
this wonderful community. It's a, it's a membership site uh, for piano teachers right around the world. And every single month, you will get what we call a curiosity box. Basically, it is a monthly bundle of teaching resources and it will pop into your inbox. Um, you will click on it and that will bring you, of course, to the link inside our, uh, our website that is exclusively um, accessed by members. And I know that people do get quite confused about this because we do have a lot of free stuff as well. We send out a free blog every single Friday. Um, we do numerous free webinars like the one that we're doing today. But just to be clear that there is this whole other side of what we do. In fact, this is really what Sally and I spend most of our time doing. Um, and this is um, pulling together uh, these resources for, uh, for members of the community. Um, and we are not the only ones who exclusively contribute to this. We get speakers from all around the world and they are contributing to this training as well. So uh, we know that piano teaching is, is a very lonely profession and this is our way of being able to unite and bring together piano teachers from around the world to feel part of a community. Um, to feel loved and to feel cared for and um, to get the training and development that um, so often we, we, we can lack uh, because what happens is normally you get quite a lot of one day events happening around the country here, there and yonder. But we know from, um, from our own personal experience as well as from research that a one day event is not enough to, to actually make a meaningful change to, to our teaching. Uh, we know that it's important that we have ongoing development and this is what the community does. So you have these monthly bundles um, and our enrollments are only open for about three times in the year, for eight days at a time. So uh, an enrollment is currently open. It will close this Saturday, so on the 11th of November. And when you become a member, you will get access to um, how-to videos, uh, workbooks and resources. There will be a, a live monthly webinar. And again, that's separate, that's different from these free webinars that we run. And again, it's where we answer our members' questions with regards to the particular topic that we've been looking at. Um, we have a fabulous Facebook group, again, exclusively for members, where Every month you, you get to chat about the topic and, and further and develop these, these ideas. And we also then have bonus resources and discount deals for members as well. So that includes things like um, Manumat, um, give 20% off, um, Alfred uh, in the UK, give 25% off. Um, if you use piano safari materials, you get 20% off those as well. Um, and there's lots of other discount deals that um, you have there as well. So just there on Monday, every single, uh, the, the first Monday of every month, there is a new Curiosity Box is released. And of course, uh, this past Monday, first Monday of November. So we have our Christmas box out, which is uh, entitled A Christmas Full of Harmony. And inside that, you will be discovering how to teach your students about chords and cadences and modulations. And uh, the email has actually just gone out to, to all members there earlier on today. And um, it's very much like presents around the tree because we are going to be drip feeding lots of other little goodies in. Uh, at the minute, there are a series of videos where Sally presents triads and the idea is that you share these videos directly with your students. I then have created workbooks so that, again, the idea is that the student looks at the, work, at the video, they then fill in the workbook. Um, and that's getting them started to actually um, playing music, Christmas songs, and understanding the, uh, the harmonic progressions. Forrest Kinney is doing our, our live webinar, and we also, um, Forrest has created a couple of exclusive to the community PDFs. Um, very exciting stuff, and there is lots, lots more to come. Um, we'll have uh, Alison Matthews is going to be teaching a couple of her students, her composition, so you get to see how she teaches harmony. So it's really, and as I say, that's only the, that's in the beginning. We're going to be drip feeding lots of other things into that particular box. 
Um, the page is up there, so you've probably had a read about what, what the members say. Uh, how much is it? It is £197 for yearly membership. Uh, we've got the US dollars there on the screen as well. Um, and you can also enroll as a monthly member. We also have a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you get in there and you decide, actually, it's not a good fit for what you need right now, then all you need to do is simply drop us an email and um, you will get all of your money back, no questions asked. Um, yearly members, again, the big incentive to go ahead and to purchase yearly membership is because you get oodles of extra uh, online resources. So when I send out the replay um, after this call, which everyone uh, will be getting, I will also be including this brochure um, in that email. So you can have a look at that. And if you have any further questions, all you need to do is simply ask. Okay, that's me done uh, with that. Again, if there's any questions, feel free to just hop in and ask them. But I think for now, it's time I'm going to hand back over to Sally. Okay, well, I'm going to get my screen going now, Sharon. So if you want to just keep going and talk about, have a look down the, uh, the notes, I'm just going to be sharing my screen, folks, with everybody. Okay. My curious reading presentation, which is... Okay. okay. I'm just going to check that I can still see the chat. Okay. okay. So here we go. Um, Gary McPherson and Alf Gabrielson have written or edited a book called The Science of Psychology of Music Performance. Great book. Um, heavy, but great. And this is a quote directly from them. And I love this word about being contentious. One of the most contentious issues in music pedagogy concerns when and how to introduce notation to beginning instrumentalists. And they're quite right. It is contentious. Nobody really knows, I have to say. Nobody really knows. Um, there hasn't been enough research into it. And even... If there was ever enough research into it, people would still argue about it in the same way that people argue about how the best, what is the best way to learning for learn children learning to read um, literature and stuff. Um, I think it's because being human, we always um, are inquiring and always asking more questions. This is why I said earlier, there's never answers. There's just lots more questions. And what I'm about to present to you is based on research. It's not my opinion. It is, I suppose, my opinion based on the research that I have done. And that means I've been pulling together all the different threads that I can find about teaching notation. However, as I say, it is a contentious issue and I don't expect everybody to agree with my presentation. Um, and that's just fine. I can live with that. But what we do know is that singing, singing is a common, should be a common and natural part of all early instrumental lessons. Absolutely. And I think it's important as well, and I'll probably say this again later, to, to recognise, whoops, sorry folks, um, to recognise that in the UK, in America, in Canada, and in other countries in the world, we as piano teachers have an incredible job to do because we tend to teach children the piano, but not only the piano, we tend to teach them how to read notation, we, tend, we have to teach them musicianship, we have to teach them the full package. Whereas if you go to countries like Finland, like Hungary, there and even like France and quite a few other European countries there musicianship happens first so children become musicians and they learn to read in their musicianship and then when they come to their piano lesson it is really just about the piano and how to play the piano so they're not learning how to read the music in these particular situations here in the UK and in the other countries I mentioned that isn't the case so to think that we can just take a piano based approach to learning to read notation is, I think, a, a misperception. And singing has to be, as it says, a common and natural part. So let's have a look, first of all, though, at what has to happen before we can get anywhere close, anywhere close to 
introducing any notation and i think you know in in my research what i've done is i've looked at um, the different approaches let's say a tutor book might take now we all use tutor books myself amongst everybody else because it helps guide us and take us through all the different concepts that have to be taught but one tutor book is not always the same as another tutor book as you all know because you will all have your favorites out there if you look at some tutor books they go straight in with notation and actually if you look at the tutor book it's about teaching notation not about teaching the piano or not about learning to play the piano and this is a really really important thing that we have to put in before we start reading we have to get some pre-notation skills and that can be playing by rote and playing by ear so this is our pre-notation learning sequence we should all be aiming for absolutely all of us unless our pupils are going for musicianship as a separate thing so you can see from here singing externally leads to singing internally in other words we're doing it in our thinking voice that's our first precondition and then the second part of it singing can lead to playing and again that can be by rote and then that can be by ear so um, this isn't all about playing by rote but it is about this idea of getting children playing children need to be able to play or pupils adults even need to be able to play the piano as well as learning to read they are two separate things if children can only play what they can read then that's when we end up with children who are really quite demotivated and rather switched off by the whole thing playing by rote means that they can learn pieces that are really quite advanced they'd never ever be able to read them but they feel and they sound good so for example um one of my young pupils that i've got at the moment elsie and she is you uh, learning a piece by rote and yes it happens to be one of the pieces from um piano safari and i think she's doing hungry herbie hippo and the big grin that comes over her face when she gets to the end of that especially when dad's listening and i'm accompanying her is just splendid it it is it just shows that you know it it is motivating her and um last week she started to learn hungry herbie hippo and it was rather slow rather slow work she's a bit a bit um a bit timid and then but she's worked at it at home and this week she came in and we got it up to quite a speed and uh, she was very chuffed with herself i have to say so playing by rote is really really important and um being able to do that is is an absolutely i think vital feature of learning notation to be honest so what the sequence should look like is you've got playing music and reading music on equal par both being developed together and if you develop them together that then leads to playing from written music yeah but that isn't the starting point playing from written music is not the starting point it is the point that you come to all right so how to put notation into its proper place let's go on so this wonderful man edwin gordon um and he is a very very well-known music educator over in america he died sadly i think 18 months two years ago and this is um something from his i think last keynote speech that he gave in 2015 and it's really a fascinating keynote speech it was given to the national conference for keyboard pedagogy and i wish i'd been there um and this is a quote taken from it um, there are five music skill vocabularies in sequential order they are one listening two singing and chanting three audiating and improvising four reading and five writing and then he goes on and says typically piano instruction is begun with the fourth vocabulary and as I've already said, that's fine as long as one, two, and three are all in place and are being have already been developed. But if they haven't been developed, to start there is, I think, somewhat precarious. And we know that um, learning to read notation the demands of learning to read notation are really considerable. So John Hattie, 
and this is nothing to do with the piano now he is just talking about education how we learn and how we develop and he's saying development requires time devoted to processing lower order skills under conditions of relative ease enjoyment and strong motivation so lower order skills are skills that we don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about so that might be um, for example being able to have a steady pulse it might be being able to clap a rhythm pattern without having to think about it and the important thing is that we have to be able to do this under conditions of relative ease enjoyment and motivated and if the children spend a great deal of time doing these things then skillfulness and automaticity will follow so in other words if we spend our time doing these really quite easy basic stuff and more time than you can possibly imagine needs to be spent doing this i'll say that again more time than you can possibly imagine needs to be spent doing this in lots of different fun enjoyable ways then our pupils will become more skillful and their reading of let's say a rhythm pattern will become more and more automatic it all requires though a great deal of brain work it is hard work and it's very easy for us to overload our students cognitively for them just to have too much to think about they're reading the notes they're trying to translate the notes they're trying to read the rhythms they're trying to translate it into their fingers not only are they reading but they're trying to play it on the piano and they're trying to find the right notes as well it is really complex so what we have to do when we're teaching notation is it has to be built on musical hooks and these musical hooks can include things like having a feel for the pulse having a sense of rhythm having a sense of pitch feeling senses that's what it's all about it's all built on those feelings and senses so listen reading these are the conditions that we need for um, to be successful their listening skills have to be absolutely switched on. So this is before we start to read. These are the conditions we need to have in place. Listening skills really switched on. And their basic musical skills and understanding are really, really firm. So the pupils should be able to, for example, keep a steady pulse at different tempos. Be able to imitate and tap simple rhythm patterns all before they can read. And they should also be able to demonstrate an understanding of sounds that are higher or lower, patterns moving up, down, or that are repeated. Those are all the conditions that need to be in place. So now let's go on and have a look at the five key principles that research shows we have to have in order for any kind of notation reading to be successful. And these principles are common to both rhythm and pitch. And today we're just going to focus on the pitch. If you want some strategies for teaching rhythm, uh, we really recommend that you have a look at our Let's Play series. And in that you'll see us introducing rhythm, rhythm um, and strategies and demonstrating how children can be taught rhythms in particular ways. So here are our five key key principles first of all we have to set the right conditions we have to make sure that we introduce whatever it is in musically meaningful ways we have to use specific strategies we have to be specific and direct with our instructions and we have to be persistent and consistent in our teaching and those of you that are in the community will know those are words I'm using all the time these days, being consistent and persistent. So five key principles for starting to read pitch notation. Here we go. So the first one is to set the right conditions. I'm just going to have a swig of water. Hang on a minute, folks. Actually, maybe are there any questions, Sharon, before we go on? anybody's got anything just shout out and um, if we don't pick them up now we can pick them up later can't hear you you'll need to switch your um, microphone on okay there we go um, Caitlin asks how does practice work when learning is by rote 
Um, well, it can work in a number of ways. It can work by, first of all, you understanding the piece clearly enough so that you can really break it up and teach it to the pupil in the patterns because teaching okay so that here's a really important point thank you for that that um, a, a successful piece to teach by rote is full of patterns and once the pupil has learnt the pattern then basically they have begun to uh, get their hands around and their ears and their fingers around what that pattern might be so um, I will come back to that actually and when I'm back on screen and demonstrate one at the piano for you. Yeah, I will come back and I'll play one of June Armstrong's pieces and show you how I might introduce that to a student by rote. But of course there is this wonderful thing called um, iPhones and cameras and things like that. So if necessary, you either video it um, and send it through to parents. And again, you can do that using something called Notemaker Cadenza. Uh, or note maker, I think it is just that, actually, um, or you can get the parent to video it so that they can refer to it at home. But good question. Just remind me to come back to that at the end and to leave room. Any other questions? Lovely, will do. Um, we have Isabel who says, I do find that each individual beginner needs a different approach to learning notation. Some love mnemonics and respond to them. Others don't find them helpful at all. I often start with the middle C and being on the special ledger line between the two staves and work upwards and downwards from there. Some students can immediately see the ladders off the stave, others can't. So an individual and flexible approach is essential. I think we would all agree with you there. It was Isabel, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, right. And I'm glad, thank you for mentioning that because no pupil is the same and every single one needs, you, we need to be sympathetic and we need to be really um, listening in, in all senses to our pupils and their needs and working out what is best for them. But these principles that I'm about to show you, you know, you can see that if you take the principles, you apply them to any pupil, any pupil at all. And if you get these principles in place, then you will make life so much easier for yourself and for your pupils as well. Okay. But you're not going to apply them in the same way to every single pupil. I quite agree. Absolutely. Um, okay. I think that's pretty much it. I know Rachel says, can we access Sally's wonderful presentation after the webinar? Uh, yes, you can. Um, for 72 hours, it will be available. Um, and for those who are members of the community, it will go in the bonus video section so you get ongoing access to it if you're a member. Okay, back to you, Sally. Okay, so here with this first one, the first key principle is that we have to set the right conditions. Now, we've already talked about that um, in terms of before you even start to read, but now getting them reading, I think one of the conditions is that they have prior exposure to a score so if you think about the way that children learn to read um, before they learn to read and write they're already speaking before they learn to read and write they're speaking they're listening they're imitating and they are seeing and they are being read to they're being read to so my great nieces and nephews um, you know have been read to since their very earliest days Ruel Sharon's little boy already has some books you know, and he is being read to those books. He hasn't got the funkiest what all those pictures and those words mean, but he will understand very soon that there is a connection. And as his brain connects up together and he grows, he will begin to associate the word dog with the picture of the dog. In other words, we're pre-faming reading for him. So he is beginning to see what words look like and what they sound like. And I, this really, really struck me, I have to say, when I began to look into this whole notation business, because we don't do this enough. We just don't do this pre-framing for our students when they're starting to read. So what I've started to do is I've actually started to um, show my pupils pieces of music. So here is the, the Mozart Sonata. I'm sitting at the top end of the piano, so I'll just... Yeah, um, I'll just give you a little blast of that. And I will play that to a pupil. I won't play much of it, but I will play it to a pupil. And then I'll ask them, you know, what can they see? And it could be that they've already learned about crotchets and quavers, tars and tetes. 
And I'll say, can you find any TARS? And all of a sudden, they're finding things on that music that they already know about. And then, of course, it's also giving them the, the, the sense of, well, maybe one day I can play that as well. So I think making sure that we set those right conditions, it's sh um, making sure that they know that this is what pianists do. This is the sort of thing that you will be able to do one day. It shows it's normal and it creates a sense of expectation and it pre-frames the whole reading activity. So, condition two. We need to introduce notes in ways that are musically meaningful. So individual notes really have no musical meaning. I can play a note. Lovely. But it's only when one note is connected to another that we have a musical gesture. And all of a sudden we have something that is emotional. It's only two notes, but nevertheless, there is a sense of something happening there. So the basic musical gesture is a phrase. Let's have a look at this piece, for example. Now, even if you don't know the song, which some of you might, but don't tell us, um, even if you don't know the song, even if the clef is a barrier, I suspect if I shut up for a bit, you'll still get a sense of the phrase shape and the note relationships. So how did you do that? Have a think about what you did. You look at the rhythm, you know the rhythm. You, when I say no, I mean no in a deep sense. I mean, you, you can already hear without having to even think about it. Yeah? It's a lower order skill, in other words, by now. It, you weren't cognitively being challenged to the highest degree. That was really very easy. And then what about the pitch notation? You were following, I would think, the shapes and the patterns. You weren't sitting there thinking, oh, well, if this was treble clef, that would be an F. I don't think you needed to do that. You should be able to hear that melodic um, framework, that melodic direction, and the fact that the final phrase goes down. So you've read that through just using your um, sense of shape and your sense of patterns. Here's another example. And this is a song. I'll just sing you the song. And just watch and see if you can um, work out how the, what I've written there corresponds with the song. And also the fact that it has four phrases. Because phrases are really a starting point for teaching musical notation. They really are. Mm, sing this. Rain is falling down. Rain is falling down. Pitta patta pitta patta. The rain is falling down. Yeah. And um, I nearly forgot to change, change slide there. But hopefully you've seen that it has four phrases and that you could actually label that structure. So we've got the first phrase, which we'll call A. The second phrase, which happens to be the same, so we'll call it A as well. The third phrase, which is slightly different, so we'll call that B. And then the fourth phrase, which is A. And again, it's about the shapes and the patterns. How were you able to follow the pitch shapes? Well, because the umbrellas go down and stuff like that. So what I'm trying to convey here is that the phrase is the basic musical unit. The basic musical gesture is a phrase. And that was this wonderful man called Michael Stocks, who used to be um, director of curriculum and training at the Voices Foundation. He taught me that, that the phrase is the basic musical gesture. And it's for that reason, really, why I, you know, I, I think that one of the reasons why mnemonics really don't work, because they are not musically meaningful. They are isolated pitches. They can work sometimes with some children in some circumstances. Let's keep going, because I'm getting ahead of myself. So using specific strategies 
This is the third principle. Use specific strategies to teach fixed pitch notation. So you might say, yes, well, okay. All cows eating grass, there we go. That is a specific strategy. But as I've said, what they're not is musically meaningful. And I don't know whether you've all encountered pupils who, you know, if they're using mnemonics, then they look at the note, the third note on the treble clef, let's say, and half their brain time, their working out time is, is oh, what's the rhyme again? And E, G, B. And their, their brain is being used to count up those lines. Yeah? So out of all the brain power that's needed, two thirds of it has got nothing to do with the name of the note. And that note is in isolation anyhow. So what else are we teaching them except to just read that note? Now, sometimes later on in the learning process, and do mean later on, then sometimes mnemonics can be useful. But as an initial starting point, they really have very little use at all. And, you know, maybe if you've had some problems with mnemonics, it would be good, it would be good to hear what, what they've been. So what specific strategies are you going to use instead? Okay, so here are two. And landmark notes, which I know some of you have mentioned already. And then the second thing is alphabet strings, which you probably, unless you're a curious pianist, you won't have come across. So here we go. Landmark notes, as one of my pupils said, are notes that are easily identifiable. So here we have in London, easily identifiable landmarks. And again, you know, I, with my pupils, I will give them a little hook to rem help them to remember this word landmark notes. So for example, we have got a London bus somewhere around the place these days, and I've also got a telephone box, and um, anything that will help them to remember what their landmark notes are. And these landmark notes are notes that are easily identifiable. And I will start, and I think somebody has already mentioned, you know, about middle C. Yes, middle C is a landmark note, although it's probably not the one I would necessarily start with. I wouldn't introduce all these landmark notes at any one time. I would be introducing probably treble G first and bass F. And notice what I'm calling them. I'm being specific in my use of language. More on that later. I would call this the G clef, and I would call this the F clef. Yes, they can also be called the treble G, and yes, the, uh, the treble clef and the bass clef. One name does not preclude the other name. I've just got to be clear in the way that I use my names, that's all. And yes, we've got middle C. And through repeated, and I mean repeated practice, um, the pupils will learn to recognize these certain landmark notes and there's a wonderful symmetry about it as well isn't there and it took me forever and ever and ever to see this symmetry and it continues the symmetry because if you go up to top C here and base C down here of course we have two ledger lines there we have two ledger lines there middle C here on one line up to the second line down to the second line up to the third space down to the third space up to the fifth line, down to the fifth line. Lovely, lovely. And our brain loves that. You know, it loves that. It goes, oh, lovely, you've given me a pattern. And of course, that's what, what, that's what makes our brains very happy, makes them able to connect up very, very quickly. So that's one strategy to use and to, to, to try using landmark notes. Here's another one. And this is one that um, I've been working with, and this is called alphabet strings. And to really experience alphabet strings, um, we have to put you all through the H experiment. Apologies if you've done it before, but even so, you might still struggle a little bit. Um, because I think we take for granted that children understand the, the musical alphabet. And we get them to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and we get them to play A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Oh, can you go backwards? Yes. G, F, E, D, C, B, A. And then we might do it for a week or two, and then we sort of move on. But the piano keyboard 
is incredibly complex again you know and we know it's full of patterns we know this we find it easy but for a child you know these white notes all look the same they don't necessarily see the black patterns it takes a long time it also takes a long time for them to understand um, the relationship of a to b to c let alone from a to g to f and with alphabet strings we can help them really begin to get uh, much more familiar so let's do the h experiment so the h experiment I could tell you're all really wanting to do this out there. Um, so let's pretend then that the musical alphabet now starts on H. So we've got H, I, J, K, L, M, N. Hope you're all saying it. Let's do it again. You ready? We'll start on, on H. Here's our H. H, I, J, K, L, M, N. Now we're going to go backwards. N, M, L, K, J, I, h even reading it and trying to play it i'm stuttering so now could could we do the 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 um triad of h major what would the triad of h major be h j and go on tell me l there we go there's l thank you sharon i could see she could do them. okay and what about the triad of i minor what would i minor be i k and m mm, absolutely so now let's just see what happens though so you've got that the h experiment you've, you've got all those in in place so now let's go on could you trouble is you can see my thing so i'm going to go up like that okay there we go now you can't see it at all so could let's do it again starting on h i'd like you wherever you are in the world to say the musical alphabet starting on h off we go. H, I, J, K, L, M, N, backwards, N, M, and by the time you get to the end of that, your brain's going, Ooh. and what about the H major R triad? What about the triad of H major? H, H, J, and L, okay. But you can see what I mean. It's quite hard work, isn't it? What about I minor? I, K, and M. Hope you get my... I mean, usually when I'm doing this live, there's a lot of laughter at this moment in time as people fall around and realise actually they can't do that very well. That's what we're asking our pupils to do. Yeah, that's what we're asking them to deal with on a, on a weekly basis. And... Um, I think it takes a lot longer, a lot longer than we, we, we uh, allow them to actually get this. So what I've been experimenting with is something called alphabet strings. And a string is literally a string of notes, you know, like a tetrachord or a pentachord is the string of five notes or a string of four notes. Um, but so this is an alphabet string and I will drill I will drill these and I think you know drilling is not a bad thing if you do it in a in a fun and very condensed kind of way so we'll literally get on our on our legs and we'll march to the beat and as we march to the beat we'll say c d e f g and then they'll c d e f g and I'll model it yes and then they'll say it back to me so off we go c d e f g your turn my turn c d e d c your turn c e g your turn g f e d c your turn etc and i often put a timer on my phone so that i don't get carried away and go on for too long and you know all the pants off everybody basically and it also it just makes it into a bit more of a game you know oh can we beat the clock basically and see how quickly we can do this and every time we might go and do um, a new key let's say or move to a new place like g we would do the alphabet string starting on g because of course that's a completely different kettle of fish isn't it g a b c d 
I, I think there's something in, in this idea of alphabet strings. It might not be completely thought through yet, but I, I'm hoping that you've got the idea that we need to give more care and consideration, please, to the way that we teach the musical alphabet and that we have to have, have a strategy to, um, to really use to, to, uh, to introduce these things. Okay, so let's move on now to our next principle, which is about being specific and direct. And I've kind of hinted at this really as we go along in our teaching, we want to use the same language all the time. So we're saying landmark notes, we're calling it treble G, bass F. We're not changing the goalposts and suddenly giving it a different name. So we have to make sure that we thought through the strategy and that we use the strategy every single time in exactly the same way. We want it to lead to that automatic processing. And if I just go back again to our song that we had back here, let's just go back to here. Automatic processing to an automatic recognition of those rhythm patterns. We want our pupil to look at those and to know what that rhythm sounds like. It's not just being able to play it through the piano. That's not good enough. <laughs> That's not automatic processing. That's being able to play it through the piano, but they've got to be able to hear it in their head. That thinking is really important. Um, and the same with the notation. They want to be able to read that shape, that pattern, thank you, going up. We want them to see that pattern going up. We want them to see this pattern going down and beginning to have an understanding of how that's going to sound. Um, so automatic processing of um, shapes and patterns so that it's what we could all call a no brainer. Because if they're having to look at no, if they're having to look at the rhythm and work that out, and then if they're having to look at the pitch and work isolated pitches out, one brain, you know, one thought for every single note, then that all takes time and that's going to lead to this cognitive overload, which is not very conducive to playing the piano. Okay, so final one. Oh, here we go. Be persistent and be consistent. This is not short term work. This is not short term work. Okay. Learning to read notation successfully, independently, I think is probably a three to four year project. I'll say it again. Learning to read notation independently is probably a three to four year project. And we can really gradually move them along the path to become more and more fluent in their reading. If we do it once and think, oh, that's it, they, they, they'll understand, they won't, they won't have got it. It does take time, it takes persistency and it takes consistency of our approach and the method of delivery. So that actually when they see something like this, you are able to look at that and you're able to hear it, aren't you? That's the state we want our pupils to be in. Maybe not with that piece, but with another piece. Okay, that doesn't come easily. And you just have to think about the way we learn to read and how long that takes. You know, and, and actually if you compare the way that we learn to read, when a child goes into reception in year one and year two, those first three years are really all about learning to read. And, you know, they do reading every single day and it still takes three years. They do reading every single day. They don't do reading with us every single day, you know, on a one to one basis. It's, it's not happening. So who's to say it should even take three years. So let's look at a piece like Autumn Leaves. And, um, you know, here we've got the patterns, we've got the phrases. What are we going to get the pupils to look for? We're going to get them to look for the patterns of the, uh, of the way that the uh, pitch is moving down. We might get them to recognize the landmark notes. So, for example, here, you know, we might get them to put a ring around the landmark note and then see whether this is a step or a skip. 
and then see what's the shape here that's that's falling down to the ground and here we're beginning to read the shapes i'm not going to want them to read g f e d c don't want them to think about the names of those notes but i do want them to see the g and then i want them to see the descending pattern It's a very black and white thing that I'm presenting you with at the moment. And of course, there are many, many other shades of grey going on there. It's, it is tough. Learning to read notation is tough. It does take time. And we have forgotten as expert readers. You know, we have lots of experience and prior knowledge to draw upon. And we look at known shapes and patterns with a familiarity and a sense of ease. But of course, our pupils don't. So we really just have to guide them, really, really have to guide them about how to get them down that pathway towards becoming expert readers. And we do it incrementally and we do it with these basic strategies and principles at the back of our mind. Okay, so here we go. What two things could you put into practice immediately to change the way you introduce notation? I mean, it could be not just introduce notation, but the way you introduce and then develop notation. So back over to Sharon. Let's see what kind of questions have come in because I know I talked for England there. That's great, Sally. Thank you so much. Okay, so um <clears throat> let's see where we left off okay i'm just going to go right up um caitlin had another question mm, i can see this one what about those who learn easily by ear and then are lazy about learning mm. properly well the next bit of my presentation which we haven't really got time for was about sneaky ways sneaky ways to practice note reading and um I don't think children are lazy um, to, to read notation. I think they just use to their advantage what comes easiest. Yeah? Um, and I think we're all lazy in that sense. And I have lots of these students. Um, and I think what you have to do is you have to be a bit sneaky about it. So as I say, they play a tune like Autumn Leaves. And you ask them before they start, can they circle um, treble G? Can they put a triangle around uh, middle C? Yeah, that's one little way. I, I don't want them to be thinking about notation names as, as they play. But I might take a piece, for example, and um, I might ask them to copy it out and then write the names of the notes underneath it. I might just give them two bars to copy out. Or I might um, actually get them to play a piece by ear and then write it down themselves. So you kind of turn it around and do it backwards. <laughs> if you get them to write, it's actually often a very powerful thing to do. Um, the other thing I might do is I might use Flashnote Derby or Note Rush or one of these apps that you can get that will really help. Um, and children tend to love these, you know, you just and I just focus on two or three notes. I don't use to begin with. I don't splurge loads of notes um, at them and just get them to go away and practice on those. Or I might use my floor stave, which um, I might get from Manumat. Let me just pick mine up one moment, please, folks, because it's just here. One moment. off that for a moment so here we have my floor stave sneaky that goes on the floor and then i have lots of um, notes and transparencies that go on here as well so if i've been doing a particular note or if i've got a particular piece that i'm doing with a student i might set this out before the lesson on the floor with the music written on it and then they have to put the correct letter names in there. They don't know their note reading. And, and what I'm not doing is I'm not making them do the note reading at the piano, because that's not what I want to do, because that's just going to lead to unmusical playing and, and a loss of joy, I think, in, in what they're doing. Mm, and it can lead to a lot of tension in playing as well, unnecessary tension. 
Yes, that, absolutely, Sharon. Absolutely. And this is where this inner ear idea comes in. If you hear the music before you want to play it, then the tension doesn't happen. Tension will tend to happen when they don't have the sound in their head. And it's the same for us as well. If we don't have the sound in our head, then we will tend to play in rather a tense way. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, there are. Yes, just to quickly answer, Rachel, your question. The florist, Dave, you get it from Manumat. Thanks, oh. Liz, for hopping in there with that response. Um, <clears throat> yes, Gwen says, biggest problem uh, with mnemonics, parents insisting on using them during weekly practice despite me not having taught them. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 is, it is an interesting issue, that one is, you know, um, and something that Sharon and I are very conscious of that, um, that we will be stepping up a lot more in our talking directly to parents so that, <laughs> you know, we will be having videos out there that you'll say, just go, just go and watch this, you know, yes. and um, you'll be able to direct people. To because I think, I think mnemonics have been, um, seem to have been quite popular and the chances are if parents once learned the piano or an instrument themselves that that's what they learned by yeah. and again if they're helping their children that's probably their kind of their their gut reaction is yeah. is to use what they know absolutely um, and they're trying to be helpful i think that that's the other thing to remember is parents are trying to be helpful when they do that um an interesting question there from melanie uh thanks for the alphabet strings um, is it not important to say sing them at pitch when drilling? Well, you're not the first person to ask that, and the honest answer is I don't know, Melanie. Um, I took the singing away from it because I felt that that could get in the way and become more important than the actual alphabet note letters. Yeah, so I want them to understand the alphabet letters rather than the singing. But I think there is a there is a place for getting them to sing. Yeah, there is a place there. But I'm not sure, basically, is what I'm saying. Um, and I don't know who it is, but Anna... Uh, Anna something? Anastasia. Anastasia, that's right. I've only, I can only see A-N-A. -A, Anna. <laughs> and it's talking about sulfur and notation in terms of consistency. Um, so I agree, you have to be really careful. And again, consistency. So, so far are what I call singing names. So again, I, those are terms I use, ting, singing names, as opposed to fixed letter names. So I will just make sure that I'm always clear about which ones we're doing. And the singing is for singing away from the piano. Often we can put it on the piano, but then we can move the so's and the me's or whatever all over the place. Whereas when we fix it, it then can only live in one place. OK. Um, but really, the, the sulfur is more for the singing names are more for the musicianship side of things. And this is where it's important to do that first before you then go on to the piano. Yeah. OK, um, I was going to I was just going to to finish off with. Have I got time, Sharon? I know I'm going on a bit here. But I think go, go for it, because we still have. Yeah, people seem to be hanging around, so. Well, I sat here by my piano just in case. Uh, yeah, you can see. So there's a great piece by June Armstrong, which I've been doing a few times, called Building Blocks. And it's from her toy box, I think. And it goes like this. rather fast version yeah but it it's a great piece because it's just made up out of a whole series of intervals so if I'm teaching this to a pupil by rote then what I quite often have is I use something like these these little sort of post-it notes and we decorate the piano and I will ask them the first question might be where do my thumbs go and I'll say okay with a green put a, a green and a yellow sticker for each of the notes my thumb plays on. So I'd start with this one down here, and they'd be standing, and they'd put the sticker on, and then they'd put the sticker on here, and then the sticker on here, and the sticker on here. And what they'd find is that, of course, the G and the A have the sticker, 
and the G and the A have the sticker. Yeah? And then you say, well, look, what fingers am I using here? Five and one, four and one, three and one, two and one. And by that point, they're practically pushing me off the stool because they want to come and play that as well. And once they can do that, they can play the piece because that's all the piece does. And how long does it take? Five minutes, that does. So as I say, pieces by rote have to be highly patterned, highly patterned. And you, the teacher, have to think very carefully about how you introduce it, yeah? And then you can... And Liz says, I am so doing building blocks this afternoon. <laughs> Such a great piece. It's fabulous. And, you know, you couldn't hear, but the piano was just singing to me by the time I got to the top of there. And how great would that feel for a young child to be able to sit there and be able to play that. You've got that lovely movement, free movement across the piano. You've got your foot on the pedal. You've got this sense of, oh, I'm a musician. I'll go and practice. Yay. Um, Caitlin says, recommendation for good, highly patterned pieces. Um, again, Caitlin, as you've heard Sally say, that was from June Armstrong. I'm not so sure if you're familiar with, uh, with June's music, but if you just type June Armstrong um, into um, piano music into Google, you will come up with June's website and she does... Um, lots of great stuff for rope playing also piano safari um okay i i know we are we're almost okay. at 10 minutes yes. over um so i think we we should wrap up but um we just want to say a huge huge thank you for to to everyone who's joined us live we know that lots more of you will be watching the replay so if you're watching the replay later just to give a special shout out and hello to you as well um and yes <laughs> of course isabel building she says building blocks is brilliant and with the pedal it could easily pass for debussy yeah. imagine it's 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 just the feeling when um when little ones play things like that it's as Sally says, it's about making music. Mm. Yeah, um, make it musically meaningful. Musically meaningful. Because that's what turns us all on. That's what, you know, that's what Sharon and I love about what we do. And, you know, it's what we love about sharing all this stuff with everybody out there. Because we're, we're not the fonts of all knowledge, but... It, it is what we do is so exciting being a piano teacher is such a privilege and uh, we we just get such a kick from from our teaching and from um, talking to other teachers that let's it's just brilliant just like yeah Rachel says brilliant webinar thank you so much Rachel I, I'm pretty sure that we possibly met you at the IBRSM conference this may be your first webinar kind of somehow remember that name so if that's um where you heard about this webinar and if that's why you're on it and it's your first one then a special lovely to have you um louise says thank you feeling excited for the afternoon's teaching um yes rachel says that's right lovely lovely to have you on on the call so Thank you so much. Irina says thank you so much as well. Listen, guys, thank you so much for joining us. I am now going to... Oh, another question. Rosemary says, how long before the replay will be available? Um, oh, okay. You've got the different time zones. Not to worry. Um, I will be uploading it and getting that email out within the next couple of hours. Um, so it will be, um, it'll be coming very soon. Anastasia says, obviously that's your first webinar as well with us. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We just loved having you on the call. So, um, look out for the, the replay. Um, and, uh, again, if you want to find out a little bit more, if you find this webinar useful, the community is full, full of, um, of ideas, um, and videos and resources 
um, our, our whole mission, <laughs> Sally and I, we, our mission is to inspire and enthuse piano teachers around the world because I know it's, we have been there where it's been so easy to get in a rut. Um, it's not a nice place to be. And um, we're all about inspiring you and then helping us all bounce ideas off and inspire each other because that's essentially what happens inside the community. Mm. So listen, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Sally, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all soon. Okay. Have a great afternoon, um, evening, morning, wherever you, you are in the world. And we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.